Hello, welcome to the League of Women Voters of Portland's Voter Forum for the November 3, 2020 runoff election for Circuit Court, 4th Judicial District, Position 12. I am Chris Kobe, the forum moderator for the League of Women Voters of Portland. The League is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to making democracy work. We believe democracy works best when voters are informed about issues and engaged in their communities. We are presenting this forum to give Portland voters the opportunity to know more about the two candidates for judge on the ballot, Adrian Brown and Rima Gondor. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot hold in-person candidate events. I am joining you through the auspices of the Metro East Community Media Studio while our candidates are participating from their own locations. We are grateful for support from the Carol and Velma Saling Foundation, the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund, the Weiss Foundation, the Sarah Fruing Fund, and our media partner, Metro East Community Media. And now for the forum rules. The candidates may give a two minute opening statement. They will then each have 90 seconds to answer a series of questions we have prepared, and each will have a two-minute closing statement. We will alternate the order in which the candidates answer these questions. I ask the candidates to adhere to the allotted time limits, please. As determined by a coin toss, Ms. Gondor will give the first opening statement. Ms. Gondor, please proceed. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, League of uh, Women Voters. Uh, I am running because I believe it is important now more than ever to have qualified judges from unrepresented populations. I've experienced war and the scars that it can leave physically and mentally. I came to understand how our reactions to the world around us are colored with the traumas we carry. I also saw firsthand how a lack of justice, equity, inclusion can shatter not only people, but countries. It is important to ensure that a person does not have to be frightened or intimidated by the judicial system and to show that one not need forsake their rights because they are afraid they are not going to be treated fairly and that they do not have equal access to our courts. Justice, it's done in small steps every day by the hard work of listening to and seeing every person in their own light. It will take a special kind of experience to render justice in the coming month and years actually, the tests are coming into view. We face continued white supremacy in all its forms, unemployment over 10%, potentially significant landlord and tenant tensions, commercial and residential uh, over rents and evictions, disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on our people um, of color, frontline workers and medical professionals. A ripple of foreclosures and business closings is inevitable. This is a generational reshaping of our community, and these issues will come before the courts for years to come. I have helped process families on immigration, readjustment days, fought recognition of women and persons of color in our legal community, mentored and guided young lawyers, volunteered in every direction while keeping and maintaining my uh, woman-certified run law firm. We should have a judge who understands the multiple communities we are uh, made of in Multnomah County, and I will work as hard as ever to ensure that everybody is welcome and included in community leaders and our commissioners and other community organizations uh, have put their faith behind me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Brown, you may give your opening statement at this time. Thank you, and thank you as well to the League of Women Voters and for all of you who are watching this program. My name is Adrienne Brown, and I'm running for Multnomah County Circuit Court Judge Position 12 because I know firsthand the power the judge has in making a difference in families' lives, in children's lives, and indeed in the community. As a young child, I was raised by a single mom for several years, and she was someone who worked extremely hard to fight for child support for my sister and me. I saw through the power of a judge who acted with courage grant my mother child support that she had been deprived of for over 10 years. That judge did something that not all judges will do, which is to take a leap of faith in knowing 
that that decision would impact positively the family that was appearing before him. And indeed it did. As a result, my mom was able to help provide for my sister and me. And yet I still took a ROTC scholarship to go to college. In order to pay for college, I served the Air Force for almost seven years. I was an Air Force Judge Advocate General. And in that capacity, I had the privilege to both serve in helping victims understand their rights during criminal trials. And I also had the privilege of representing airmen and other service members who were subject to felony criminal prosecutions. These are exactly the same kinds of cases that we see in our state courts. Child abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence, rape, maiming, fraud, drug trafficking. I later joined the U.S. Attorney's Office in order to work for the public continually. In that capacity, I created my civil rights position. Before I came, the United States Attorney's Office did not have a civil rights program. I crafted it knowing the voices in our system were not being heard. As a result, under President Obama's Justice Department, I was tapped to be the National Civil Rights Coordinator. I looked to bring all of that experience, personal and professional, to the bench. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the questions part of the forum, starting with Ms. Brown. First question, what particular skills and experience qualify you for the position of circuit court judge? Thank you. Yes, uh, as I alluded to in my opening, I have experience uh, across, the across the board in the courtroom, whether it's as a, a plaintiff's attorney, a defense attorney, civil or criminal, I have handled it all. I have handled cases involving both victims of crime, children who have had to testify before their accuser, sometimes being their own family members. And I have also served to represent individuals charged with crimes. As a prosecutor, I saw the impact that mandatory minimums have and the ties that it binds judges, criminal defense attorneys, and prosecutors. I am also aware of the struggle that civil plaintiffs have in bringing forward their claims, particularly unrepresented individuals. I have worked with Legal Aid, Disability Rights Oregon, and the Fair Housing Council of Oregon, all in my capacity as a civil rights coordinator in the United States Attorney's Office. And in that work, I have contacted a broad range of our community throughout the entirety of Multnomah County and indeed throughout the state of Oregon. I look forward to using that experience and not only helping individuals, but in helping system reform as well. I have worked on issues thrust before our court that are at the forefront of everybody's minds today. Policing practices, mental health reform, disability access, fair housing access, veterans rights. I look forward to bringing all of that experience to bear in serving as your next elected district court judge, circuit court judge, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gondor. Question to you, what particular skills and experience qualify you for the position of circuit court judge? Hi, Chris. Yeah, I have, I have been an attorney for 23 years. I um, own my own woman certified business, a law firm that focuses on women and woman issues and making sure that uh, I help uh, women, both attorneys and uh, others in the legal profession be spotlighted. But I talked about experience. Here's the difference. There's, a, there's experience in state court, there's experience, experience in federal court. I have both those experiences. I practice predominantly in state court, predominantly in Multnomah County. That's the court that I practice in. Those are um, the cases that I bring or I defend. I have done civil law from both sides, uh, plaintiff and defense. I do complex civil litigation where it's not just one party or two, it is several, like several, sometimes 15 to 20 parties. I also have worked uh, with uh, domestic violence victims. I've worked with mental health, um, uh, people suffering mental, mental health. I also, what is really important, and I would like that to come across, I work with our community, with our immigrant community and non-English speaking community to bring cases nobody else would take. Cases uh, that they can't bring pro se because of language, or they can't self-represent because of language barriers. I bring those cases 
my experience is relevant to the court we're going to be present, presiding at or uh, ruling on. So thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to ask question two. Uh, and this will go to Ms. Uh, Ganderer first. Judges can be assigned to perform various functions within the circuit court. For example, criminal, civil, family, juvenile, probate. Based on your legal career and your life experience, for which judicial court, judicial assignment, do you think you are best qualified? Um, civil and criminal. Um, I will be very frank. I don't do family law, so that would not uh, be a place I would be. I represented people in probate. Um, again, that's not my forte. Um, most of the cases um, in Multnomah County are going to be almost actually equal civil, criminal. Uh, criminal does get a lot more. Um, there's rules that cases have to come forward faster. But um, there is a also there is a lack of civil uh, everyday civil practice in all its aspect, whether it's products liability, whether it is uh, fraud, whether it's uh, contract interpretation. And I uh, have huge strength in those areas, and I will be bringing those forward. Um, and um, you said the juvenile, unfortunately. I haven't done juvenile for a long time, but I've done uh, mental health, I've done uh, conservatorships. So those I could help and assist when is needed with the courts. Okay. And one of the things that um, as an attorney that you learn very quickly, especially an attorney who practices and is licensed in four different states and practices in state and federal court is there is always a learning curve and it's a question of your ability to learn and understand what is uh, what you need to know. And that's something I feel very comfortable with to be able to assist wherever I'm needed by the court. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gander. Ms. Brown, same question to you. For which uh, area of the court do you believe your life experience and career best qualify you? Thank you. Yes, the work of a circuit court judge is as a generalist, and I am prepared to do the work of the court, whatever the court desires to assign me. I look forward to my opportunity and using my experience that I have, having prosecuted and defended criminal cases for over eight years, and also having worked in civil litigation for the past 10 years. I have worked on both cases involving issues that directly come before the state court. As a prosecutor and as a defender, I worked on issues that the court sees regularly, which involves victims of crime. I look forward to using that experience to be able to see the humanity on both sides of those issues. The shorthand that I like to give to people is that I have both prepared a victim for trial who was 10 years old and had to testify against her own father for sexual abuse. And I have also had to prepare to cross-examine a child who was accusing my client of sexual abuse. I, have, I can see the humanity on both sides, and that's not it. I've also walked the talk in having broad range of experience. As a civil litigator, I have tried employment discrimination cases. I have worked on cases involving medical malpractice. I have worked on cases involving torts, and I look forward to helping the work of the court, whatever the court needs to assign. I also look forward to using my personal and professional experience across the community and bringing in community voices and to making sure that the work of the court is accessible to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Next question goes to start with to Ms. Brown. Turning um, to the question of criminal cases again, what is, in your opinion, the central goal of sentencing in criminal cases? And please explain your answer. Yes, so uh, sentencing can be a very complicated part of a judge's um, obligation in the sense that it's a point in time where decisions have to be made to both protect victims as well as protect the rights of defendants and the interest of the community to ensure that there is not reoffending and to ensure that victims are protected. So a judge must, must have to balance all of these things. And there are definitely interest in making sure that there's rehabilitation and 
looking at alternatives to incarceration for those individuals where perhaps incarceration isn't going to solve the problem. So there isn't one particular area that I believe that a judge should look at when looking at sentencing. I think it's important for the judge to consider all of the factors. And this is why it can be very hard in mandatory minimum cases for a judge to be able to consider those factors. Yet I do know the power of a judge to be able to vary from mandatory min min minimums and to be able to use the facts and circumstances in order to make reasonable findings to do so. And I will use my experience, both as I said, as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney, to know what is the best thing to be done. I think this experience is invaluable to bring to the court because I have seen it both from the perspective of a litigator as well as a community civil rights coordinator. And I look forward to using that experience. I will say that for the first time a couple days ago, I heard that my opponent, uh, when she spoke at a forum, that she had criminal uh, prosecution experience. That is news to me and I would love to hear more about that. Um, I have a proven record of criminal justice experience and look forward to bringing it to bear. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, Ms. Gandahar, the same question to you. What for you is the central goal of sentencing in criminal cases? And please explain your answer. Yes, Grace. The central goal, there's, there's no central goal, but there's a couple. One is reha rehabilitating, uh, getting uh, the person um, who is being accused and who is being uh, sentenced to make sure that it's not just a punishment, um, that it actually were, uh, you are, whatever the ruling, you're, the sentencing you're doing is um, going to actually help this person become a better member of our society. And part of it, and the other part is victims' rights, making sure that the victim is heard, that the victim's rights are taken into consideration, and not just through the DA's office, uh, presenting that, but through the victim and victim, victim advocacy groups. Um, one of the things that has always affected me personally is growing up where there are no um, checks and balances. There is no, um, if you get accused of a crime and you don't have the money and you don't have the resources. Where I grew up, you had no chance. You were put in prison, you were not seen. So making sure for me that uh, the resources are equal between uh, the public defenders and uh, the DA, making sure that our system actually works properly only when everybody is presented equally uh, and has the same access to the same um, rights, the same skills. So that's one of the central issues with um, criminal reform and criminal justice and making sure that we work towards it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Gandahar, I'll ask you to uh, respond to the next question. Judges can be, as, I'm sorry, <laughs> turning to a trial court judge's work, let's start with the discussion of a big part of the court's caseload, criminal cases. What are your ideas on releasing defendants pending their trials? What works and what doesn't? I didn't get your, is, is the question, what do you do with pending a defendant, uh, releasing defendants pending tri trial? Yes. Okay. So a big part of this is, again, it goes to resources and who has and who does not have the resources. I believe bail um, and ability to pay bail is not what should be looked at or the factors looked at to make sure uh, that somebody is released. Because just because you can pay a million dollar bail does not mean that um, you don't constitute a risk to society. And so those, th that is what needs to be looked at is um, the, the person released, can we release with no bail? Uh, are we putting bail just because we know they can't afford it and they can't leave? Is it safety that we're looking at? Is a person, um, do they have community support? Do they have uh, the resources? Do they have uh, the resources to get help and to be accountable to be able to show up to court? Uh, do they have, um, are they a risk? I mean, how much of a risk are they and are they a risk? And is really keeping them in um, jail and preventing them from uh, earning a living or being with their families, is that really gonna make society as a whole 
safer. So those are some of the consideration. And if it's somebody with mental health, with um, drug issues, somebody who is houseless, those are all factors that we need to consider and we need to work on as a court and as a community on how to provide them the help in between so that hopefully by the time they come to trial, they are um, better and able to assist in their defense in the cases. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Ms. Brown, what are your ideas on releasing criminal defendants pending their trials? What works and what doesn't? Thank you. Yes, I, I believe that these types of decisions need to be made on an individual basis, looking at the facts and circumstances of everything that needs to be presented to the court from the party's attorneys and from the defendant, him or herself as well. Um, family members, I believe to the extent possible, the judge needs to take in as much information as possible. And at the same time, I know judges in the Multnomah County Circuit Court are dealing with a very uh, busy docket. And so it's balancing those interests of being sure everyone is heard while also making sure that this individual is heard and their families are heard and the victims are heard. And so I think throughout that balance, the idea is how do we make sure this person is coming back to court and not gonna continue to be a threat to society if they have been. And so I think definitely bail is a certain, is definitely an issue that needs to be addressed. There is disproportionate impacts that uh, I agree with my opponent that it, it's not, uh, it's certainly not fairness in the justice system if you're holding someone who cannot pay the bail but who's, who's not going to be a violent offender. And so those need to be looked at. Those issues are also needing to be addressed in working with the pretrial services officer that is presenting information to you that have that has interviewed the defendant and interviewed the family. This is something that I have done repeatedly as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney in making these assessments. And so I've seen what these reports look like. I know the players in the system and it's about including all those players in and making sure the judge has the most information she can have in making a decision. Uh, at the end I, of the day. I'm going to no. stop. I'm going to stop you there. Sure. Um, Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question, Ms. Brown. You get to answer this one first. How can the circuit courts that are assigned family law matters work best in handling custody and support cases? Yes, so uh, this is um, one of those issues that, you know, I bring some personal uh, experience to, to bear on this just because I, I went through it as a child. And uh, while my dad left when I was uh, three, my mom did not uh, have a day, her day in court until I was about 14 years old. So there were many, many years that we went and trying to figure this out um, on our own as a family until a judge got involved. And I saw again, the power of the judge to assess what was gonna help this family be able to succeed in the community. Um, and I know that that type of situation needs a judge that can stay on the case long-term this is why, as, as, as uh, my opponent pointed out earlier in the program, that this is why there is a specialty area in the circuit court for family law. Uh, it is in the best interest of the family to have a judge that knows the family. And so to the extent possible, keeping that same judge on the case. Now I know that's not always practicable and therefore judges need to be also talking to each other and ensuring that that information is conveyed. Um, one of the interests is certainly in uh, ensuring that the children are heard. I know that there is a uh, foundation that's out there that's uh, led by one of the prominent uh, family law attorneys in town who looks at this issue of making sure children are heard as well. And I think that's extremely important having been a child and not feeling heard. Uh, I also believe that it's important to ensure that there are supports for the family. So bringing in resources, making sure the judges are aware of the resources, because there are certain times that families aren't even gonna know what questions to ask and they okay. need to do Thank you. Um, Ms. Gandahar, the same question to you. How can the circuit courts assign family law matters work best in handling custody and support cases? I think one of the most important things uh, with custody and support is to have the resources, the court resources to hear and listen to cases uh, quickly. Uh, that's one of the things uh, people have been suffering through the pandemic. People with custody cases and support cases uh, have not been able to get their cases heard, and that affects families and children 
significantly. So that's one uh, of the things that the courts um, need to look at and are continuing. They, they've started doing some hearings, but um, making sure that there are enough judges and enough people to listen to the cases and make decisions. The other one is, frankly, I deal with a lot of community members. Um, day in and day out, I get calls. They don't have money. They are going through a divorce. They have a spouse that has all the income and they are gonna lose their children. And there is very few resources. There is um, a law center you can send them to, there's a few organizations, but very, very few resources uh, for them to be able to bring their cases and make sure that they actually are protected. So increasing um, lawyers um, in, uh, that do nonprofit work, helping um, families with child support and custody is very important. And uh, spareheading, hopefully, and uh, a way to get some civil attorney, like a right to some civil attorneys for some of the cases that come in. And one of my, dear to my heart, is court care, where we do provide care in Multnomah County for okay. children that come into court with their parents. Thank you. All right, next question. How can, um, what tools can the trial courts use to reduce domestic violence in our society? Um, Ms. Gandahar, this question to you first. Hi, Chris. As a very young uh, law student, I worked uh, for the city attorney's office uh, doing uh, domestic violence prosecutions. And those are some of, uh, that was a time in the 90s where um, there were new laws coming in regarding when the domestic violence victim recants and uh, what evidence is allowed to be brought into the courtroom to prove the case. Um, that is actually one of the tools, but one of the things that is always comes back is do the victims have a place, a safe place to go back to? Do they have an ability to safe keep their children? Do they have an ability to support themselves? So some of the tools that the court could help is um, encouraging more resources, but also in terms of managing the docket is making sure that more check-ins with um, on the case, uh, getting the alleged abuser in more often and uh, checking in with the victim and victim rights to make sure that it's not gone back to the way it was and that there are enough people looking out to make sure that the victim is safe, that the family is safe, that the children are safe. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Brown, same question to you. What tools can the trial courts use to reduce domestic violence in our society? Yes, so this is uh, certainly a, a complex issue and, and one that I, I worked on uh, as a prosecutor and working with primarily my cases involved uh, victims, victims of domestic violence, such as rape, assault, maiming, sodomy. I, I, I worked with sexual assault victims and victims of crime um, that were directly related to the relationships that they had with others. And these are issues, I say they're complex because they in typically involve families or people that the victim knows. And in that sense, it's beyond, a, in a many ways, uh, the court's sort of the, the area of last resort, right? So things didn't work out before. And so if, to the extent that a judge can be helpful in being out in the community to help reach out to victims before they end up in court, to help reach out to entities and to organizations that help educate victims. Uh, whether it's uh, supporting the work of the sexual assault response coordinators or the work of the victim witness programs throughout, throughout our state, whether it's at the state level, county level, or city level. It's so important to make sure that judges are involved outside of the four corners of their courtroom. Because by the time something gets to the courtroom, it's about keeping that person safe. If, if, they, if there is a showing that the person has been harmed by domestic violence, and it's about making sure that person has resources to ensure that they, are, they have a safety plan. But, but at, the, at the time that a judge can get involved is before they even get in the courtroom. Okay, thank you. Next question also for, uh, to uh, Ms. Brown. 
how can a circuit court judge use her position to advance racial equity in the fourth judicial district? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is something that's um, been heavy, heavy on my mind uh, ever since I started working on the policing practices case that I handled for about seven years, which came out of a result of, of members of the community uh, both uh, exhausted by not being heard about racial justice issues in policing, as well as in the mental health arena as well. And I believe um, that the power that the judge has is to um, not only be aware of the issues in her courtroom. So um, making sure, like again, as I mentioned in my previous answer, by the time something comes to your courtroom, um, there's a lot that's happened before that. And so it's important, first of all, if, if, it's, if you're starting with your courtroom, to make sure you have a welcoming environment for everyone that needs to enter the courtroom. And indeed, everyone that enters the courthouse. And the way you know whether it's welcoming or not is by going out in, in the community and asking what they need to have confidence in the judiciary. What is missing in the judiciary to allow access for persons of color and black people in our community? And making sure that you are listening to those ideas and then coming back and helping implement them. But in the work of the policing case, it's also about looking outside of the community uh, even before issues come into your courtroom. So it's making sure that judges are part of in, involved in community organizations, involved in mentoring, and involved in even at the school level in making sure that there is a role to play for justice and fairness before someone gets into the courtroom. Thank you. Uh, the same question to you, Ms. Gandover. How can a circuit court judge use her position to advance racial equity in the fourth judicial district? Chris, this is um, an issue that I've been involved in, in year, for years. From the moment I arrived in Oregon, um, I can go through personal experiences where I have been, um, my child um, has, I've had to take my child's diaper off in airports over and over again because of Islamophobia and uh, phobia of Arab Americans. I came to Oregon and it was very unwelcoming. And I have worked for years to try to get rid of stereotypes, to try to increase access in the courts, in, um, in our legal profession. This is one thing about being marginalized in having to deal with racial issues. Um, when you are that person that's being marginalized and having to deal with racial um, justice issues and racial inequalities, you don't get to choose when to experience those confrontations. They come to you, whether you like them or not. So being that person, being out, and I have been out in the community for years, not two or three, 18 years, to the expense of my kids, my husband, trying to improve access, trying to talk, and being part of the community. People come to me all the time, every day, with cases, with issues, with problems, with racial uh, injustice. So being that person and already known in the community for that work will help my message come across. It will help me make sure that when I speak to other judges, uh, they listen to what people's experiences are and what is going on in their lives and how cases affect them. Thank, uh, thank you. Uh, next question also to Ms. Gandor. Are you satisfied with the circuit court's use and treatment of jurors? If not, what changes would you advocate? Uh, currently, during COVID, there's not that many <laughs> jurors being used, and that's a problem. Um, the Multnomah County has been very good at trying to make sure everybody's safe, and that's a great thing, but uh, people's rights are being affected. In terms of jurors overall, the last case I tried in Multnomah County last uh, summer uh, was, uh, it was very interesting when we talked to the jury afterwards that they cared. They actually asked the question, why are there no people of color on this jury? Why, wh where are they? And that was coming from the jury. So obviously we're not doing well enough. When the jurors are looking around and saying in the jury room, there, are, there were people of color and now we're here and we're done with the case and we're talking to you attorneys. Where are the people of color? Why were they off the jury? What happened to them? 
So that, I think in that, I think going out in the community, making sure that people of color feel that when they do come as a juror to the court, that they are going not to be kicked out because they're, uh, for whatever reason, um, not going to be chosen and that we need them. We need their perspective. We need that important perspective because you can't have justice when you don't have the right perspectives, when you don't have the right people making the decisions. So that outreach is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Brown, same question to you. Are you satisfied with the circuit court's use and treatment of jurors? If not, what changes would you advocate? I think this is a I think this is a great question and this is exactly the kind of question that I think it would be great to take out to the community. I can speak from my experiences as being chosen as a juror. Um, I, I served as a as I didn't actually get to sit for the trial, but being chosen to come in and uh, you know watch the video, had a judge present, and people proceeded to try to think of every excuse possible to get out of jury service. So I think one of the important principles that a judge can bring and that the judiciary can bring is impressing upon the community why this is so important. It is very heartening to hear the feedback that my opponent just talked about from jurors that were participating. Uh, but I, I have also seen as an attorney, uh, not just as a perspective of a juror, but as an attorney, see people during voir dire think of multiple ways to try to get out of jury service. And this is a problem. This is, I, I hope if nothing else comes to light uh, from this COVID-19 pandemic, from the news media that's happening surrounding uh, the issues of, of Ruth Justice Ginsburg's uh, death and uh, uh, what's gonna happen with her successor is how important the judiciary is and the need to make sure that that message is communicated to our voters, to the people in our communities. I agree that we need to make sure that persons of color are included in our jury pool. And so to the extent that the court has not done an audit of that system, how are we selecting juries? What is the process that the judiciary goes through? We should be looking at those things. The court is not immune to, from, from these issues. And the only way we will find out how to best serve people is to ask the question. Very good, okay, thank you. Next question. Um, we'll start with you, Ms. Brown. Are you satisfied with the current way circuit court election campaigns are funded? If not, what changes would you support? I, I'm so glad you asked this question, uh, Chris, because I had no idea before I started running uh, to become a judge um, the amount of resources it would take. I always, out of principle, had a passion and a desire for campaigns campaign finance reform in order to balance the scales of a, of a race, but now I have lived it firsthand. I, I strongly, uh, it's one of the things that if I get elected, I, I would really like to see some reform on this issue. Um, Rima and I have had to run with, uh, you know, the hands behind our back. We were supposed to be a political candidate, but yet we're supposed to also raise money without asking for it. Um, it's extremely challenging, and yet we're expected to do everything another candidate does, uh, which is make sure that we message the voters through digital advertising, paid mail. Uh, we're also expected to have websites that judges don't have themselves. Um, and this is not to say that there shouldn't be an election. I just think that there's definitely, there's definitely room for conversation about how it's funded. And I, 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 I would be a true advocate of, of public financing uh, for something like a nonpartisan judicial race. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gandahar, same question to you. Are you satisfied with the current way circuit court election campaigns are funded? And if not, what changes would you support? Yeah, this is something me and uh, the other candidate, Adrian, do agree on. Um, there is this fallacy that I've uh, discovered <laughs> that as judges or judicial candidates, we are supposed to be above the money. We're not supposed to know who is bringing the money. We're not supposed to ask for the money. Yet, the re uh, and it's all done through our steering committee and who we have on our steering committee. But the reality is, um, through our start, you actually have to know who gave the money, who uh, is it being reported right? What is going on? So it's this form over substance that I think we like to imagine <laughs> that the judges uh, and judicial candidates are above it all, when in reality, that is not it. 
Um, so it's one of those form over substance issues that makes maybe the judge themselves fare better, maybe the public, I don't know. So that is one, one of the issues with the way it's run. The other issue, and I've seen it uh, through pre-COVID being on the campaign trail and um, just through my life, uh, it takes a certain amount of resources to run as a candidate. This affects women. Uh, this affects uh, people of color. This affects people who don't have a lot of resources because when you're working full time, you have to still be able to provide uh, time for the campaigning. If you uh, quit your job, you've lost your source of income. So this is um, campaign reform, I think should happen for everybody, not just judges. And I feel very passionate about that so we can get more experience and um, uh, candidates from marginalized communities. All right, next question. Um, given the influence court decisions can have on society, what is your philosophy about the role of a judge as similar to or different from the roles of a legislator, advocate, or executive? We'll start with you, Ms. Gandor. Yeah, it's a very different role, right? My role as an attorney, as an advocate for my clients, um, and I say clients, different clients, different areas, is very different than what a judge does. As a judge, you can't write the laws. The legislature does. You can advocate in certain areas where it does affect the functioning of the court and, um, to help the legislature better understand what the laws they're working on um, or the laws they should impact. So that is a, the role of an advocate is one that I'm going to be sadly um, missing, but there's other ways and the role and the judge is the one who, at the end of the day, the legislature is not perfect. They write rules, they write laws that always need interpretation, always. Uh, you need an, a, a judge that knows um, why the law was written uh, and the impact of that law and is there a way to make sure that it is administered fairly and justly in the case that comes in front of you so those are what the judge can do they can and and if if through looking at cases coming in and you go okay the law was written this way and this is the way it's been interpreted but this is not the result that anybody wanted to see you can actually advocate and go and talk to the legislature about the impact of what uh, laws they've written. All right, uh, same question to you, Ms. Brown. Given the influence court decisions can have on society, what is your philosophy about the role of judge as similar to or different from the roles of a legislator, advocate, or executive? Thank you, yes, so first of all, yes, a judge, a judge has to uphold the laws that are written uh, in order to make decisions that are consistent uh, with the rule of law. However, I do believe that it is a judge's uh, role as well as a public servant to do the right thing for the right reasons and to speak up when something doesn't look right. So to the extent that a circuit court judge has an opportunity to uh, rule on an issue uh, and, and yet also say what their disagreement is, I think that's important to do. So just for case in point, um, Measure 11 is something that is, uh, is certainly uh, uh, an issue that many of us have a lot of concerns about the impact that that's had, yet judges are still bound by it. Now, to the extent a judge has an opportunity to make comments on the record or to write an opinion about that, to talk about the impacts that they have seen Measure 11 have, I think that's extremely important. And the way to do that is by, is by being a mentor in the community, connecting with community members, and making sure you're aware of it. The other way is by inviting the other branches of the government into your courtroom. I think, I think it would be uh, really important for, for the legislature to come and sit through uh, a hearing, <laughs> whether it's Measure 11 or something else that they have taken. Help educate the legislators on what the issues are. And same with the executive branch as well. Um, so to the extent that judges can use their role to convene other players in the system is very important. That's something that I've done as my work as civil rights coordinator. Thank you. 
An ultimate question. Do you feel circuit court judges should be elected or appointed and why? We'll start with Ms. Brown. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, uh, so I, uh, my opponent and I have, have, have been through both at this point. We have both attempted to be appointed and now we're both attempting to be elected. And, and uh, so uh, it's, this, is a, this is a tricky area because I don't think either system is perfect. I think there are flaws in both systems. Um, I know, and um, my opponent has experienced as well, the, the barriers that were put up, uh, maybe for different reasons, uh, to actually uh, have that one-on-one -on -one with the governor where she could talk to us and, and appoint us. Uh, I, I, from my own experience, I will say, you know, being in a public service uh, entity uh, for my entire career, I have not made the kind of political connections that maybe some others have that have access to the governor. I know that's, that's been challenging for me to get my name out there. And this is something that the election has given me the opportunity to do, to get my name out there and showcase what I can bring to the court. Yet at the same time, I would not wish the last 10 months on any of my peers. As uh, my opponent pointed out, um, it has been extremely taxing on families, um, I have a young child, he's four and a half. And uh, for the last 10 months, his mom has been working two jobs on top of being a parent. Um, I've, my cases have suffered as a result. I have many civil rights cases. The pandemic hit, George Floyd was brutally murdered. We have wildfires. We have so much crisis going on in our community and I have so many cases. I get calls every day. In fact, I have a legal assistant helping me screen those calls because there's just so many. So. I don't have a perfect answer, but the answer, the question needs to be asked. What do we do next? Okay. Uh, Ms. Gander, what do you think? Do you feel circuit court judges should be elected or appointed and why? So Chris, I support democracy beyond anything else. I believe elections are important. Elections hold people accountable. Um, yes, there needs to be reform. There needs to be changes in the way we do it because we talked about campaign reform earlier. Um, there are some advantages to, I've sat actually at, um, at least a couple times in the governor interview panels, interviewing candidates for other judicial positions. There is some advantage to that because uh, there is a more thorough review. There, uh, there is a check by the different uh, organizations like the Multnomah Bar Organization on um, the candidates and what their colleagues uh, believe of them, what uh, maybe skeletons are in the closet. So there is that vetting process, which is pretty important that is not necessarily there in this kind of race because it's so damn ballot and people don't put uh, the effort into it. Um, so with that, I, I do encourage people to look deeply into what, uh, who they're looking at to vote for. Uh, there are methods you can check PACER for federal. Um, Adrian is mostly federal, actually all uh, federal uh, attorney. Check her cases that she has. You can go into OGEN, which is the Multnomah system or the Oregon system and check on cases there. Uh, do your research, do what um, you can to actually get more than this 90 minute um, check during a forum. Okay, you've come to the last question. Thank you both for your patience. We're going to start with Ms. Ganderer. Many surveys and reports have documented declining trust in democratic institutions in our country, including our court systems. Do you agree that trust has declined? And if so, what would be your approach as a judge to rebuilding trust in our judicial process? Chris, I, unfortunately, I do agree. As I said, I'm a huge believer in democracy and our systems. The judiciary is one of the three branches and without it, it's a three-step stool that you will not have stability if you do not have a judiciary that is respected, that is listened to, that is inclusive and fair. And, um, and when I say unfortunately, I was one of, one of the reasons I decided to put my name in to be a judge was because I felt the fear that I have that with our current system, with our current administration, with the current DOJ, my rights, my family's rights, my community's rights are not going to be advocated for, they're not going to be protected. So, and that's when I had that feeling and the fear after the Muslim ban and going to the airport and helping 
people, going and talking to people in the community saying, you know what, I'm not a judge, but I'm an attorney. You call me and I will find you an attorney to help you. So yes, there is that fear. There is, and it is so important to combat that. It is so important to have people in the judiciary that people can trust, community members who have been marginalized can look at and trust and say, yes, we will get a fair shake. Yes, the judiciary is there to treat us fairly and justly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, same question to you, Ms. Brown, which is, do you agree that trust has declined? And if so, what would be your approach as a judge to rebuilding trust in our judicial process? Yes, I, I, I agree that, that trust has declined. Uh, and it's largely because we have been able to see transparently and with more voices being heard the problems that are throughout our justice system. So I first um, learned about this certainly when I was working as a prosecutor and a defense attorney and seeing the concerns that were brought forward about how decisions are made, whether it be prosecution decisions or whether it be decisions by a judge. Uh, so I am fully aware, uh, have been working on those issues for the past 20 years as a litigator in both criminal and civil cases. But more importantly, over the past 10 years in my work here in the District of Oregon, it has included community members that are directly impacted by the judiciary. When we started working on uh, the police reform, the first thing that I did was go out into the community and interview over 100 members of the community just to hear what the problems that they had had. And a lot of it was results of the justice system, results of what happened after they had been not only maybe arrested, but then later prosecuted and having to defend themselves in a way that they felt was in a very unjust system. And so I think the things that judges can do are the things that I saw some of the judges do uh, that, that encouraged me to run, which is getting out into the community asking the questions, making sure community voices are heard, um, and then implementing those reforms within the, the ability to access the justice system. The other issue is civil reform. And so okay, we're, gonna have to hold it. we're gonna have to hold it there, thank you. Okay, um, thank you for responding to all of these questions. It's been very illuminating. Uh, it's now time for closing remarks. You will each have two minutes, and Ms. Gandohar, you can begin your Closing statement. Thank you, Chris. Sorry, I had to check my mute was on. <laughs> um, I think it is, I believe, it's very important that vital perspective, different perspective, be brought to the judiciary. Because when a judge deliberates, they take in all of their lived experience, all of their experience in making the decisions in how they treat uh, people appearing before them. And we were just talking about trust in the system. If, this, if, if the judicial system, if the, ju if the judges don't represent the community they are part of, that is by itself going to cause uh, distrust in the system. I have the experience. I have community support. I have done this work for 23 years. I have done the volunteering for over 20 years in the legal community. Not recently, this is one of my favorite sayings about RBG is that the causes that have given her the most pleasure are the things that she's done when she was not paid. And I, that's an affinity I feel with her because I have my job, I have my day job that I get paid for, but everything else I've done I've done on my own time. I have lost money doing it because when I don't work, I don't have the federal government paying my salary. I don't get work, pay, I don't work for three hours because I'm presenting to Multnomah County judges about what it means to be me and living in my skin. I am losing money doing that. I am supported. I am very, very proud that 25 of the judges in Multnomah, 25 judges have endorsed me and every judge of color that has endorsed in the race has endorsed me. I have 17 out of the 18 unions endorsing me because they know the work I have done and continue to do. And then dear to my heart is National Lawyers Guild and other civil rights organizations that have endorsed and have encouraged me to keep in this race and stay steady. Thank you, Chris. I'm gonna going to, I'm going to break it there. Ms. Brown, you now have two minutes to deliver your closing statement. 
Thank you. I am writing to be a judge because I have the broad experience across the board to hear the voices from the community just as they were heard when I was a young child. I believe that it's important to make sure that a judge has a broad spectrum of experience. And my experience in this race is simply unmatched. I have brought forward the ability to hear both civil and criminal cases on both sides of the aisle. At the same time, over the past 10 years, I have worked directly in the community, not work that was assigned to me, work that I created, work that I sought out to find. And indeed, that is why I served under President Obama's Justice Department as the National Civil Rights Coordinator. And I helped build those programs across the country. When I left that position, I had successfully brought forward over 30 positions that still exist today. And yes, over the past almost four years now, I have fought extremely hard to keep my position alive. Yet I know I can be best serving the community by being involved at the local level. And that is where I wanna be. I have not only worked to make sure that communities of color are heard and that their voices are championed, but you don't need to take my word for it. Take a look at my endorsers at adrianforjudge.com and you will see people like former Senator Abel Gordley, Kathleen Sadat, former Governor Barbara Roberts, as well as Joanne Hardesty, our city commissioner, the Albina Ministerial Alliance, Coalition for Justice and Police Reform, Dr. Bethel and Dr. Haynes both endorsed me as well. We say hello from the Somali American Council of Oregon. I hope that you will take a moment to take a look at more than just the face you see here, but the faces who stand up and who stand with me to bring fairness and justice to the Multnomah County Circuit Court. Thank you. Thank you, both uh, Ms. Gandara and Ms. Brown for your participation in this voters forum. Audience members, please share this forum recording with your family and friends. We all need to be informed voters. This recording and other information about these candidates will be available on vote411.org through election day. Ballots are mailed to all registered voters starting October 14. As with all Oregon elections, it is mail-in only. Ballots are due by 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 3, into the Elections Department. Postmarks do not count. Mail your ballot, no postage required, by Tuesday, October 27, to ensure that it is received by Election Day. After October 27, find a drop-off location near you by checking www.vote411.org or your voters pamphlet. This is Chris Kobe from the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching. Please be an informed voter. And remember, your vote counts.